Well, we'll just read a couple of verses in Acts chapter 9. I don't want to take away from anything that we've heard <clears throat> already, the value and importance of that. Whether it's on the East Coast or whether it's on the West Coast, the responsibility really is the same. And we can both, we can all have a sweet savor of the Lord in our lives, wherever it might be. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9, we know the story, or most would anyway. The story of uh, Paul and his, or Saul and his conversion. Verse five, he said, Saul said, "And why? Who art thou, Lord?" And the Lord said, "I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks." And he trembling and astonished said, "Lord, what wilt thou have me to do?" And the Lord said unto him, "Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do." <clears throat> so I'm going to read. I was just thinking of that question for my few remarks. I mentioned last week. Mentioned a little bit about the winter work. And maybe I might just mention a little bit about boat work uh, today. And uh, thinking about the whole thing, there's a couple of things that came to mind. And uh, I couldn't help but think, as I looked at the boys and girls that are here uh, in this meeting, <clears throat> so I looked at them, the ones at the back and one here. You know, you never know what's being formed in the lives of these children. And some of these children that are here today and at the, the back here today, they're, they're really the future. They're the future of the assembly and the future of the believers. And you never know with these boys and girls what they will accomplish in life. And, you know, first of all, of course, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Uh, that comes right down to the day of salvation. The most important thing in the lives of boys and girls, of these boys and girls here and at the back, is to come to know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, to trust him as your Savior. And, you know, you never know what, what God can do with your life if the Lord doesn't come. You could be, well, I'm not going to put any <coughs> titles or works on, but you could be, maybe you could be the wife of a man of God and, and uh, along with him, or a boy or girl that becomes missionaries or elders in the assembly, which is a high, high calling, a high work, and uh, to live your life to bring glory to him. So I just thought the future, our future is in our boys and girls to carry on the Lord's work. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So Saul asked that question, and uh, I would say that probably in my life, I ask the same question at times. It has not; it ha doesn't have anything to do with ability. It's not ability. Lord, what, thou, what wilt thou have me to do? It's not ability. It's really availability. Am I available to what the Lord wants me to do? Because one of the uh, one of the miracles that God does, He takes ordinary people to do on the to, ex to do extraordinary things. Just ordinary people to do things that the Lord wants them to do. Most of us are just ordinary people. And uh, yet the Lord can use any of us, men or women, and boys and girls, younger ones, if we are available, if we are available for him to use. Anyway, I was thinking of a couple of things I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to mention just to get me started briefly. We were in a place called Hopedale one year. And uh, there were six of us. I don't think I mentioned it last week. There were six of us, six guys there. And we're sitting in the, uh, eating our dinner after we'd visited the community. And over at the next table, there's uh, four, four, four people sitting, three or four, I kind of forget now. Anyway, but I recognized right away that they weren't, uh, they weren't native to the, to the uh, community, <clears throat> the area. So I, I figured right away they were teachers. And uh, so anyway, after we were done eating, I went over and introduced myself and, Got talking to them, asked them where they're from, and, and they were teaching school in that Wishish, which is a number of miles up from Hopedale, and they'd come down on this day to, uh, they spend a night up there, Saturday night, and now Sunday, and uh, they're having a meal. So we're just talking, so I asked them where they're from. And so I asked one girl that was there where she's from, she said, oh, she said, I'm from a little community in, in Newfoundland, a little tiny community that, you know, you probably wouldn't, never even heard tell of. I said, oh, where's that? I said, what's the name of it? She said, a little place called Buckins. Oh, I said, I know some people in Buckins. She said, you do? And I said, yeah, I do. I knew some Christians there, of course. There was a little assembly there one time. It's not there now. I said, I know uh, Ralph Penny and Melvin Penny and the Penny brothers. Well, she said, you do? I live right next door to, to Mel. She said, I'm next, I was next door neighbor to Mel. Well, I said, is that right? That's interesting. Well, I said, Melvin, we're, the, we're of the same and uh, what he would preach is what we preach, Christians, and so on. So I said to the next girl, I said, uh, 
where are you from? She said, oh, I'm from a, uh, I'm a little island off of Newfoundland. She said, just a small island. Oh, I said, what island's that? She said, a little island called Fogo Island. Oh, I said, I know some people in Fogo Island. <laughs> so then I went on to tell some of the names of the Christians in Fogo Island of the assembly there. So anyway, we was talking, and the other, one of the other ones wasn't all that talkative. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, we were going to Nain, and then coming back to Natwashish, or Dave was in, no, Natwashish it was. And uh, she said, well, I said, is there, is there a hotel or someplace to stay in Natwashish? She said, I don't know, I'll check it out. So we were visiting through the community. So when we came back, she uh, approached me. She said, uh, there is a place to stay there, but, you know, you can stay at my place. Six of us, six guys from never met before. She never met before. She said, uh, the girl that stays with me, shares the apartment with me, she's gone home now for a few days, March break, I guess it was, and I'll go and stay with my friend here. I'll go stay with her, and you can have my apartment. So, and then she went on to tell us when we got there. We came back and got there. She said, here's the password for my, to, my computer is there. Here's the password for it that you can use the, use the computer, eat all, whatever food you want, eat away, and be, just make yourself at home. And, but she said, take everything into the basement, everything, our gas cans, our, uh, cause it might be missing in the morning. And then we parked all our machines all together like this. So they wouldn't be stolen. And, uh, anyway, you know why that happened? You know why she gave us that apartment, six guys? on that coast up there because we were connected to the Christians that she knew because of the testimony of Melvin Penny and Buckins and so that made all the difference and so our testimony maybe we don't even know it Melvin didn't realize what was going on way up there and way up there in the north coast of Labrador he didn't realize what his testimony in Buckins was going to be years this would be years later in this girl's life that would affect us Anyway, there's other things, but I'm going to move on. We, uh, we did that winter work for a while, so I said to my buddy, uh, Mr. Layden, Roll Layden, I said, I wonder what a boat work to some of these communities in the summer. If we go there in the winter, which is not all that convenient at times on certain things, you've got to keep moving, I wonder what a boat work. He said, I don't know, might. Well, I said, we should try maybe to get one for the summer. And I said, I think what I'd like to do is to rent one for the summer for a couple of weeks just to try it. So we searched all over the place and I went home to Nova Scotia and he was looking looking for a boat. One of the Christians there had a boat that offered us his boat for the summer. And uh, so when Roll called me, he said he offered, but he said, we're not take, using that boat. And I said, why is that? I thought, could be great, one of the Christians. Well, he said when he hauled that boat ashore, they had six pumps on it to try to keep the water out of it. <laughs> So he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go, go in that boat. He said, if, no, even if he offers it, even though he's offered it to us free, he said we'd be sunk before we got, maybe that's what he wanted. <laughs> so anyway, he called me about two weeks later. He said, uh, I got a boat. I said, is that right? He said, yeah, Leslie John. Leslie John Layden said he'd, he'd give us <clears throat> his boat. He'd rent it to us. Anyway, so the time came and I went over to talk to Leslie John. He said, uh, yeah, he said, you can have, you can use my boat, not using it. I said, you know what we're going to use it for, do you? He said, I do. I know what you're going to use it for. I mean, he never, he's not a gospel interest, and uh, you wouldn't get him to a gospel meeting, and he's, but, uh, but at least he's friendly. And uh, he said, no, he said, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll rent you my boat for two weeks on one condition. So I now I'm listening for the condition. He said, the condition is if Roll and Rendell go on the boat. Now, Roll would be the, my right-hand man that always went with me on the winter work and so on. And Rendell is his son, Rendell. He said, I wouldn't give my boat to my dad. He said, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't give my boat to my brothers. But if Roll and Rendell are going, I'll rent you my boat. So I thought, you know, we got the boat that summer on the testimony of that those two men in Red Bay, in that community. He wouldn't give it to his own father. He said, I wouldn't give it to my father, my boat, or my brothers. But he said, I'll give it to you if Roland Rental are going. So we took the boat that summer. <clears throat> Everything went well. We were encouraged with, with uh, what was happening. Samuel Smoning and Dell was with us that summer uh, on the boat. And uh, so I thought maybe, well, that worked good. We're going to buy one. So anyway, the next year, 
we were able to purchase a vessel. Uh, a couple of things about the boat. Place in Black Tickle, where that lady, that lady I told you about last week that got saved, and uh, her daughter in Hopedale in the winter told me about it. Well, <clears throat> we were down there, and that's where we were preaching off the boat in the open air. There was a crew of men working at a fish, at the fish plant. They were re redoing it to get it up and running again. So I, I said to them, well, I said, we won't have the meeting off uh, the meeting here by the wharf to be a, you know, to agitate the workers. We'll go on up the bay. So that's what we did. When we came back the next morning, a man came down to the wharf where it was, where we tied up. His name is Frank. He said, uh, I said, uh, I said to him, I said, uh, I hope, you know, that we didn't make a, <coughs> cause a problem with your workers and that at the fish plant there. He said, no, he said, you never. He said, I listened to every word that you fellows preached. He said, I wonder, would you have a Bible I could have? Well, we had a bunch of Bibles aboard and we'd given them all out through the communities that we'd been to before. <clears throat> I said, no, I don't have one, but I can get you one. But I said, we're going on now to Rigolette, a place called Rigolette on North. But I said, you can have my Bible. And I'll get one, and then when I come back, I'll, you know, unless you want to keep the one that I'm using in the open air, you can keep it if you want to keep it, but I'll get one for you. So when I come back, when we came back, the Bible was there, uh, sent by mail, from one of the Christians in Charlottetown, Labrador. So, but Frank was up at another place working, so I'd never seen him. So I left the Bible on the door with a little note with my address in it and said, if you don't need, you know, the my Bible, if the one that's here is enough, sufficient, you can send it to this address. So I gave my address. About three weeks later, in my mailbox was a parcel with a Bible, my Bible in it, and a little note, a little letter, Dear David, and he wrote it, <clears throat> and uh, he was just saying about the thing, but he said, I want to tell you something that happened to me in Black Tickle. He was from way out in Newfoundland. He said, as I was listening to you folks preaching and I reading the Bible, it has changed my life. My life has been changed. No, I never seen him since. I don't know where he is. And never, <clears throat> but he said, listening to you folks preach and in reading the Bible after, my life has been changed. So I thought, if there was nothing else that came out of it, even that alone in itself, down in that little place called Black Tickle. So there's a few members of the Black Tickle that sort of pulled a spot for me. We left there, we did the coast there a bit. In the year of 2000, one of the uh, Christians said to me from Newfoundland, he said, if he said, uh, what, have you th ever thought of the south coast of Newfoundland, going on the south coast? And I said, well, no, not really. Well, he said, you should. The south coast would be from Red Bay, where it's kind of the, our home base. To start on the south coast is about probably around 60 hours of steaming. And so in 60 hours of steaming, some of our weather can change pretty drastically. So anyway, the next summer we uh, decided we was going to try to make it to the south coast. Had never been down there before. Roll had never been there. None of us. Anyway, <clears throat> we went to the south coast. Went to a little community called La Poyle. We had had meetings in Gander, and a, a boy got saved in, in those meetings, going to college there. He had sent home for a Bible. He knew there was a Bible in his home, so he sent home and see if his mom and dad would send up the Bible. His name was Stephen Bond. That maybe I don't know Terry knew him or not, but and anyway, when the Bible, when he got his Bible, it was actually his dad's Bible. And his dad had received a Bible, it said on it, I think it was 1961, from the crew of the MGM, 1961. So that was Herb Harris and all those boys that went down that south coast in 1961, had went into this place called La Poyle, had distributed Bibles through the community, and this Mr. Bond, who was, I think, 12 years old at the time, he, uh, that he had got the Bible and they put his name in it from the crew of the MGM. So now we're arriving there in 2000. Had a little tent aboard the boat, and uh, we found a little spot, a little spot to put this tent up, wondering how it was going to go, what was going to happen. The community then would probably be about 250 people, maybe. Anyway, that night we had to take the sides out of the tent. We had to go all over the place and get chairs from the houses. They just came, the people came, the, spread out all over the, all over the yard. And then... Uh, 
I don't know how many was there, I think there was around 60 or something, that came and listened to the gospel that night. Then we moved up, uh, I rented a community hall in the community, and uh, so then we carried on up in the community hall. We, we was there on different occasions. Mr. Joyce was there with us for a week, one time in the gospel. And uh, I'm going to close, almost time. And uh, there was eight that professed in that uh, little community. Uh, we were able to baptize one of the girls there. She would be uh, late 30s, got saved, wanted to be baptized. So they said we'd go to Corner Brook and get baptized. She said, no, I'd like to baptize my, I would like to show everybody my community. So that's what we did. We were going to build a baptismal tank on top of the boat uh, one summer. So we got all the equipment, all the plywood and everything to build it. And then I started to, I started to uh, figure out how much weight would be in that tank on top of the boat. And the weight was astronomical. Four by eight. Four by eight tank. Water in the tank plus people in the tank. Well, it would upset the boat, maybe. It, I mean, it was tremendous, the weight of water would be there, the gallons. Anyway, we searched all over that place. We searched everywhere, you know, because it just drops off. It's just like that in the harbor, just like that. We found one little spot, and on low tide, you could just get to it, and that's it. Anyway, we baptized her there, and the crowds, the whole community, had open-air meeting, the whole crowd, the whole community watched this girl, just a wonderful testimony. We were there in January for a meeting, Roy Foster from Cornerbrook, and there was 21 from that community, 21 people that came to hear the gospel. And there's a number of villages. I'll just name the villages, and then I'm done. It's quarter two. We started at La Poyle, uh, and we had meetings there. And then the next place is Grand Brett, which wasn't too uh, friendly when we went to visit, and yet there's a lovely story of a woman got cancer and came to Halifax and got saved in the hospital while we were visiting her in the hospital in Halifax from Grand Bird. Burjo, Ramia, which is an island off of Newfoundland, uh, Grey River, which was just superb in accepting uh, material, just every, all we could get. They cut the boat loose in the first years when Mr. Joyce and them were down there. They set it loose, uh, untied it at night, and it went drifting. Mr. Joyce said, something's wrong, he said. The moon is on the wrong side of the boat. So they were, drift, they were drifting on out while they were in, in the bunk. But Grey River, big change, Grey River, Francois, uh, Galtus, McCallum, and there's different stories on some of them once. But anyway, so there was a little bit of boat work along with the, not as much as we would like, but... Anyway, the Lord's been good and given a few souls along the way. So it's just that we were available, and some of the other boys were available. It wasn't me. I, don't, I can't take any of the credit, really. But the boys that came to help, like David here with the winter work and different ones, it's actually those boys that need the, the uh, whatever, thanks, and <clears throat> the word for caring, being able to help and carry that work out. So it's available, being available. Anyway, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we just we're thankful for the privilege that Thou has given to us to be here in uh, Abbotsford at this time. We pray a blessing upon the assembly and upon the saints, and what a joy it is to be able to fellowship with those of like uh, salvation, this common salvation, because of the work of Christ. We pray a blessing upon each one, upon the boys and girls in their lives. We pray that salvation will come to this place, and that there might be rejoicing even yet over souls coming to the Savior. Undertake for us now the, throughout the remainder of the day. And for the gospel tonight, we pray a blessing. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.